Welcome back. When Ellie Savitt won the election in November to be the Washtenaw County prosecutor, it seemed a fairly quiet change, to be honest, because he ran unopposed. The race didn't get a ton of attention because it wasn't really a race. Well, just a month into his new job, He's now getting attention from all over the country for the changes that he's putting in place in very short order. Everything from eliminating requests for cash bail to announcing he will not be prosecuting consensual sex work cases. Very happy to have the new Washtenaw County prosecutor, Ellie Savitt, with us today on Flashpoint. Ellie, I, I'm wondering, so far, uh, I mentioned you ran out of post, so there wasn't obviously this big block against you to begin with, but what are you hearing so far with the changes that you've announced, some of which have been fairly eye-popping to people? Sure. So just to give a little bit of context, I was unopposed in the general election, but uh, we did have a yes. contested, a heavily contested primary, primary election yes. in Washington County and a campaign that took about a year and a half. Uh, you know, it was the first time the seat was open in nearly 30 years. And there has been a lot of energy in the community around criminal justice reform. So this is a continuation, really, of a lot of community conversations that have been going on uh, you know, from certainly the start of the primary campaign, but also uh, for years before that. You know, one of the things that I feel very fortunate about here in Washtenaw County is that we have wonderful community partners, from law enforcement to the court system to our public defender's office and from uh, our community activists. And uh, a lot of this groundwork has already been laid, and folks have been advocating for this type of change for years now. Uh, what's happened now is the prosecutor's office is doing our important part, uh, but we're not doing anything alone. We uh, did all of this in partnership with the community. All the policies yeah. that we've been releasing uh, have been the product of collaborative working groups, which have folks represented from law enforcement, survivors, advocates, prosecutors, defense lawyers, civil liberty uh, advocates and lawyers, neighborhood leaders, and the like. So the response has really been overwhelmingly positive, and I think it's a reflection not just of the fact that the groundwork has been laid here, that these conversations have been going on for a while, but also that uh, we, we do everything in collaboration here and we don't do anything alone. It's a, it's a healthy thing. It feels like America is taking a new look at its criminal justice system. And I think that you've spent a lot of time, well, you were a civil rights attorney before this, so you've obviously spent a lot of time about trying to create a more equitable um, uh, criminal justice outlook for your office. But uh, when you start talking about things like doing away with cash bail, for example, um, mm -hmm. that, 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 that's, that means that uh, you will no longer request it. It's still up to a judge, though, correct? Don't, you, you need partners on the other side of this, don't you? Of course, of course. And, uh, you know, the judges ultimately make the final decision. Yeah. What we've said is we are no longer requesting cash bail. And in every case, we are going to be making recommendations to judges, and we have been doing this for the past month, that impose appropriate non-monetary conditions up to and including uh, potentially holding somebody without bail uh, pre-trial uh, while they're awaiting ultimately a disposition in their case. Uh, on, on cash bail, uh, you know, I want to be clear, uh, cash bail is a system in which you're held pending trial, not based on how much of a threat you pose to the community, but uh, because of how much money you have in right. your bank account. Right. And all we've done is, from our perspective, taken money off the table and made sure that we are making an appropriate recommendation based on the actual danger that somebody poses. You also know, though, that there are victims' rights groups who believe that sometimes in our efforts to get the Justice Department to bend over backwards uh, for those on the wrong side of the law, uh, that sometimes it comes at the expense of victims and that, and that some would suggest that this is a, a road to being soft on crime. How do you, I know you've heard that before. How do you generally respond to that? Sure. Uh, so I'll say this. Number one, public safety and victims' rights are always front and center in my mind and in everything that we do. This is not soft on crime. This is smart on crime. Every single policy that we have released is backed by uh, extensive data and extensive research, which show that it actually makes our community safer in the long run. Uh, I believe that you know certain crimes, especially, require somebody to serve jail or prison time. But I'm also cognizant of the fact that what we know is that in a lot of cases, jail and prison can make something worse. And that's particularly true if somebody is dealing with a substance use issue, if they're dealing with a mental health issue. Yes. It is far better in yeah. the long run to address that problem at its root, to demand that somebody dealing with, say, a substance use issue or a mental health issue.
help sure. us do the hard work to rehabilitate and to get better. And if you do that and they're successful, then you don't have future crimes. All of uh, our policies are geared towards that outcome. We have to take stock of the fact that something bad happened uh, in the in the criminal justice system. It's part of what we do, and and absolutely for serious crimes, and we, your we, homicides, uh, your uh, sexual assault, when somebody is shooting at somebody else, you know, serious property crimes. You may have demonstrated that you need to be separated from the community for a while. But equally important is that we're doing everything possible to prevent future crimes from happening. The best outcome is that somebody stops the path that they're on and doesn't commit any future crimes and create future victims. And everything that we're doing is geared which, towards that end. Which all makes sense. But you also run into the criticism, I think, when you announced, for instance, you were no longer going to uh, prosecute uh, pros uh, prostitution cases. I guess we'll say consensual prostitution cases. Um, mm -hmm. th those are still laws on the books. And there are gonna be, there's going to be a criticism that you are basically legislating from your prosecutor's office, deciding which laws you like and which ones you don't. Yeah, well, you know, that's, that's something that is baked into the criminal legal system. And I'll give you another example. Uh, adultery is still illegal in the state of Michigan. It is a crime in the state of Michigan to commit adultery. I don't know a single prosecutor in the state of Michigan that would even consider bringing in adultery case because it is not in the interest of justice. Look, we have scarce resources. Uh, we cannot possibly prosecute every single law that is broken in Washtenaw County, and no prosecutor across the country prosecutes every single case sure, and every single sure. violation. But if you start, if you law. stop, if you stop prosecuting prostitution cases, are you then losing your inroad into uh, working harder on the sex trafficking problem that we have? Don't you cut off some of your avenues for an issue like that one that you have said is really important? Absolutely. And, and in fact, no, it's precisely the opposite. Uh, what we know is that when sex workers and victims of, of human trafficking in particular fear that they can be prosecuted as a result of coming to the police for help, if they are being trafficked themselves, if they know of somebody else uh, that is being trafficked, if they know of somebody that committed sexual assault or physical assault, if they fear prosecution, they are less likely to come to the police and to report that very serious crime. The criminalization of, uh, of sex work and the prosecution charges and bringing charges against folks who are engaged in that actually hampers law enforcement's ability to effectively respond to the really serious threat of human trafficking. So one of the reasons that I went so public with this is because I wanted to send a very public message. If you are being trafficked, if you are aware of people being trafficked, if you are the victim of a sexual assault or a physical assault, or if you know of somebody that is trafficking minors or is trying to purchase sex from minors, come to us, go to the police. You have nothing to fear from prosecution. We will not turn around and prosecute you because you reported that. Well, it's really fascinating uh, what you're undertaking. Uh, we're watching along with so many around the rest of the country. I hope this is uh, just the start of a number of conversations we'll have with you as you uh, march these plans forward. Uh, Ellie, thanks so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much again for having me. You bet. We'll take a quick break. Back with 3 and Out on Flashpoint in just a minute.